happens is the because um, the the satellites uh, respond to mass changes on the ground when there's more water mass on the ground, say because of a big flood, then that region exerts a greater gravitational tug on the satellites and pulls them down a little bit and you know stretches out the intersatellite distance. And same thing happens when there's less water on the ground, say like the drought in the American Southwest, so less of a gravitational tug and they float a little bit higher. So the measurements that are made are of the position of the satellites. They're made extremely accurately. It's submicron level, uh, which is a thousandth of a millimeter. So that's pretty incredible. And so by keeping track of the position of the satellites, we're able to map out the regions around the world that are gaining or losing water mass on a monthly basis. And we also look a lot at the trends now over the 20 year time period. So that's why I say it functions like a scale. It measures the change, the delta S, um, not the absolute amount. To understand the absolute amount, we'd have to make you know, zillions of measurements that we are not likely to be making. Um, and it's the change in the total water storage, all of the snow and the surface water and the soil moisture and the groundwater together. So if we want to tease it apart, like we've done looking at groundwater, then you need other data um, to, 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 um, uh, to uh, disaggregate the signal. Um, it works at large time scales over large regions, monthly and longer time scales, 150,000 square kilometers and greater. I mean, we can do downscaling with models and things like that, but you know, that's sort of the raw quote unquote footprint. So this is not at all about telling you what's happening uh, in your backyard, if you're in you know, BC, if you're in Vancouver, if you're in Victoria, this is not that. This is much more about long-term, large-scale uh, hydroclimatology, not what I would call hydrometeorology. You know, what's the soil moisture on the campus at you know, UVic outside the civil engineering building? This is not that, okay? Um, and the accuracy, that's a one and a half centimeters equivalent water height. What that really refers to is that's sort of the amount of water. Think about a centimeter and a half of water spread over 150,000 square kilometers. That's sort of the weight that you need to like perturb the satellites and get an accurate uh, measure. Um, so I had the good fortune to be at the launch of the follow-on. This was in May of 2018. And it was actually, although I tried to go to the SMAP soil moisture active passive launch in uh, 2015, it was scratched the day that I went. and. Um, so I didn't get to see it. So this was the first satellite launch that a uh, first and only satellite launch that I've been to. This is at Vandenberg Air Force Base, just uh, north of, uh, of Santa Barbara. And it was a really moving experience. You know, you can sort of tell from that picture that, uh, or you can imagine there's gonna be a lot of rumbling and a lot of earth shaking going on. And, and uh, at the same time, I found it to be pretty moving because um, I had done all this work up until this time, until 2018, written a bunch of papers. And I felt like this was sort of like for, for, your, for your generation and hopefully there'll be another, you know, this will continue for another 15 years. And people in NASA and my colleagues are already thinking about the next mission. The, the reason we call this one GRACE follow-on is because it's just like the GRACE, the original GRACE mission. So it was really pitched as a continuation mission. But at the same time now, like now, you know, my colleagues or our colleague, colleagues are working on GRACE 2, which would be an improvement. The follow-on is not an improvement, it's a, it's a continuation. Although there are some experimental things on board, it's basically the same mission continuing the same, uh, um, the same journey, so to speak. So some of the key things for my group anyway, that, that we have been able to identify from GRACE, and some of these are, are ongoing, um, global, water side, uh, global water cycle dynamics and water balance closure. Um, so GRACE gives us that storage change, which we never had before. And always, you know, still in textbooks, we talk about assuming Delta S is equal to zero, which is not, which is basically nonsense. Um, and a global map of uh, basically trends. And I call it a global map of water's past and probably future too, unless we reverse climate change and manage groundwater much better. And that leads to the third part, which is the global groundwater depletion. So um, let's look at what Grace is showing us about how global water storage is changing. And we can think about where water is in, <clears throat> on the planet, in the atmosphere. Add to the oceans and it's in the ice sheets and it's it's on land. Um, and when it comes to storage, actually, of course, the water in the atmosphere, water vapor, is super important for climate and rain and humidity and you know 
incredibly powerful greenhouse gas, in fact, the most powerful greenhouse gas. But the actual storage is like nothing compared to oceans, ice sheet, and land. Water is super heavy. And, and so obviously, you know, there's not a lot of, of water in the atmosphere compared to these other three components. And so when we when we look at a global water balance, you know, we don't, you'll see, I'll show you in a second, the atmosphere doesn't really come into play in terms of mass. And so this is something that, you know, here's a story for young scientists. I mean, this is a paper that we, um, started talking about and wrote our first proposal in 2004 at a Grace Science team meeting. And you can see um, when it was published. Uh, sorry, this is up here twice. But yeah, it was it was published in 2021. So we uh, took a few crocs at it through the years and sometimes just takes a long time to, um, you know, there are different reasons for it. Some other deeper research needed to be done on sort of geodetic variations and stuff, but also just, um, you know, I think the issue for me was I never really had a student who was working on it. So it was always sort of me trying to engage uh, various postdocs to, to work on it. Anyway, you finally get it, finally get it done. And so what we're looking at is how all the water is moving around from the land, um, you know, back and forth between the land and the ocean. And in the background, the, the ice sheets are melting away. So really what we're looking at, again, these are the monthly ups and downs, sort of like the seasonal cycle of the water storage in the ocean, shown in blue. And so there's that big upward trend, of course, because ice sheets are melting. We can see the ice sheets in, uh, here in, uh, for Greenland and Antarctica in red and black. So they've got this downward trend. But we've got the, you know, the ocean, just like the land, has a wet season and a dry season. Um, and uh, so this would be, you know, more runoff and more precipitation into the ocean, and this would be more evaporation from the ocean. So you've got the seasonal ups and downs, but the long-term increasing trend. We've got the ice sheets that are driving that, but what we didn't really know until the GRACE mission, and, and really you're only just starting to realize now, I'd say over the last four or five years, is that the, you know, we've got this downward trend here in land. And that's disturbing because, you know, we like to think of, hang on, I'm in my parents' house and they actually have um, a phone on the wall, which I, I need to go. So we are seeing for the first time this decreasing trend, but also, um, you know, this trade off. You see the land and the ocean are a mirror image of each other. So when one goes up, the other goes down. And that's really the water cycle, right? So when water leaves the ocean as evaporation, it comes to the land as as pre uh, precipitation, it might be stored as snow. So there's always this up and down. Um, so that's that's pretty cool to see. And we can, although I haven't shown it here, I don't think the amplitude of those ocean and land signals becomes very important because the bigger amplitude means basically more water is being exchanged between the land and the ocean, right? So if it goes up more, that means there's more evaporation and then more precipitation on land and, and more runoff off of the land. So the amplitude of that becomes very important. So we part of this paper is looking at the change of the amplitude and the amplitude as a measure of the strength of the water cycle. So we're able to track just using the storage data, the sort of waxing and waning, the strength, the acceleration, deceleration of the water cycle. So we thought that was uh, pretty cool. Um, so just looking at, you know, a little bit more, so it showed the sort of the seasonal ups and downs, but let's look at these trends a little bit. And so here's the uh, ocean trend. And so that's rising at about two millimeters per year, sea level, uh, sea level rise. Um, and then here's, uh, Greenland and, uh, here's Antarctica. And like I said, we never had the land before. So to see this big downward trend and also here, notice the trend here, the minus 0.86, this is in terms of the contributions to sea level, so normalized by the, the um, area of the ocean. Um, that uh, minus 0.86 is actually bigger than Greenland and bigger than Antarctica. So like for the first time, the land is contributing more water through, uh, you know, uh, glaciers melting, through permafrost melting, through snow melting. Uh, contributing more water to sea level rise than Greenland and Antarctica. So that's, you know, that's, that's pretty serious. And so, you know, we're working on trying to figure out where it's all coming from and doing these kind of IPCC type things. So here's the 
ocean trend that I just showed you, Antarctica, Greenland, land. And so now we need to take the land and split it up into, well, what's happening with the glaciers? That's shown here in yellow. What's happening with everything else? This is the sum of everything else, meaning like where's flooding, where's drought, where's groundwater depletion. And so we've kind of been, so this is work in progress. So I, I, don't, I don't have the answers. But I will say that in the preliminary look, um, the groundwater, the, the most recent um, set of slides we have on this, you know, I don't have them here, but I mean, most recent set of research, you know, our last research meeting on this, on this project, the groundwater is actually bigger than the um, glaciers. So the groundwater contribution to sea level rise bigger than the glaciers. And so that's a, that's a first. So anyway, that's something that's actually manageable, right? I mean, it's nice to think that we can manage climate change and maybe if we get our acts together, we can slow the rate of warming, but we can definitely manage groundwater, right? That's a human choice too, and how to, how to manage it or how to not manage it. So then there's the global maps. Um, and to me, this is really like a, a crowning achievement of the GRACE mission to be able to look at this map and say, you know, this is how freshwater availability is changing. So the reds are losing water. These are the trends uh, over, and I'll show you the 20 year trends later, but these are the trends when we published this paper in 2018. Um, and uh, the uh, reds are losing and the, and the blues are gaining. And you know, some of these rates are pretty significant. Um, and so, you know, hot spots for the glaciers melting, or sorry, the ice sheets melting, glaciers melting. Um, and then we're seeing this background pattern of um, high latitude precip and low latitude. So wet areas getting wetter and mid latitude drying. So dry areas getting drier. And I'll show you a separate slide, a paper we did on that. Then extreme, so the droughts, uh, um, draw your attention to the Ukraine drought, which has been going on for a while. Um, but, you know, flooding happening around the world. So these changing streams that we hear about are starting to show up in the in the grace data. And the rest of these spots are actually aquifers. So a lot of these, you know, a lot of this is ground, a lot of this is groundwater. So this is the depletion of the world's major aquifers. You know, over half of them are being rapidly depleted, mostly for uh, for irrigation, for, for food production. So I'll, I'll return to that. So it's a very complicated picture. And it's one that I think most people don't really appreciate fully. Um, and that we, I think, need to come together and rally around as a community to get the message out and to you know, do what we can to better, better manage water in the way that we do for carbon. So it really waters next on the horizon. This is the... Um, work we did on the <clears throat> wet areas getting wetter, the dry areas getting drier. So I'm trying to convince you that we're seeing that in the GRACE data. Um, as, as it anticipated, as predicted by IPCC, going back to some of the earliest reports, um, can't remember which one this was, but maybe around 2000 or 2001 or something. Blue areas here, increasing precipitation, red areas, decreasing precip, but predicted for the end of the 21st century. And so, you know, are we seeing it now? And so we wrote this paper in 2016, just looking at the background, um, dry air is getting drier, wet air is getting wetter. So this is probably the first, uh, this is the first paper to really show that with observations. Um, so then the other big contribution, I think, uh, for, for my group, and this is one that's really been um, really caught on quite a bit around the world with other researchers, um, you know, improving, extending, you know, proving upon this work that we've done, using GRACE to do remote sensing of groundwater. Um, and we first thought about it again before the mission even launched, we started thinking about it in the, in the um, early, sorry, in the late 90s, an interesting story. When we, put, when we submitted this paper, it was rejected and they said like, it'll never happen. And I had to like appeal to the editor saying, you know, pretty cool idea you please rethink that and he was really nice about it. it's like okay yeah okay well let's talk about it and so we ended up publishing the paper and actually the results that we get are much better than we anticipated in this first paper we thought that there would be a lot more error so it's worked out a lot a lot better so you know the basic idea is that grace is telling us this the change on in storage on land is is composed of all these different storages, the snow, the surface water, the soil, the moisture, the groundwater, like you see in a big basin like this. And if we're only interested in the groundwater, the blue part, well, we could just rearrange that equation 
and I'm going to figure out where to get the other data from. That's the that's the trick. So Grace tells us this: if we want to isolate the groundwater, then we need to re remove the snow, the surface water, and the soil moisture. So where you get the data, you know, and the errors associated with those data sources become the whole, you know, the whole thing. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have really trusted data sources, like you know, we do this in California, we have a lot of confidence in it. But if you're doing it in another country, you know, a lot of countries don't share their data. Um, so you can't get ground-based data. It's really difficult to, to validate. We might have to rely on satellites. We might have to rely on models. And so whenever we do a study like that, we use whatever mix. We try to figure out like the best available, the mix of data that is the best available. So here's an example, and this is our most recent example actually from, from the Central Valley in California. And so here's the GRACE time series for California, showing the storage ups and downs, but you can see these distinct phases of drought, 2006 to 2010, 2011 to 2016, and now like 2019 to the present. Okay, so that's the total. And so what we want to do is this, we want to subtract the snow, the surface water, and the soil moisture. Um, and so that's here. The soil moisture we took from the NASA GLDAS average of the land surface models. Surface water, we used uh, California Department of Water Resources reservoir data. And snow water equivalent, we used the SNODAS, the, the Weather Service assimilated product, its model and observations assimilated together. So we take B, we subtract it from A. In the bottom, we're just comparing to observations to see how well GRACE is doing, just compared to P minus E minus Q on the left and GRACE on the right. So and it's a good, good comparison. But really what I want to get it is A minus B gives us groundwater for a change, the change in groundwater storage. And it looks like this. Um, and so we see this overall uh, trend of depletion. We see this very distinctive behavior of a little recharge during wet periods and a lot more um, depletion during dry periods. And in fact, so we've got this paper that's in review trying to get information as recently as this morning, trying to get information about the progress out of the editor and being unsuccessful. Um, but anyway, this latest phase is actually steeper. So there's an acceleration uh, of uh, oh, just over the last you know, three, or, or three or so years. And we look at this in the longer term context, comparing GRACE data here in blue to USGS data here in red, going back to 1962, so this is like cumulative groundwater depletion in the Central Valley. Colors in the background represent the climate. So is it a wet period, the dark blue? Is it a drought, the dark tan? Or is it moderately, moderately wet, the light blue, or, or moderately dry, the, the tan? Sorry, the light tan. Again, we see that long-term depletion. It's, I don't know what it is, about two cubic kilometers per year, maybe a little bit more. Um, that same pattern of a little recharge during the wet periods and a lot of depletion during the drought. And you could also see that the GRACE data are starting to fall beneath the long-term average, which is acceleration. Um, so, you know, none of that's good because the situation there in California is fairly dire. It's, you know, mega drought and um, groundwater levels are falling and land is subsiding and, and, and all that. And, you know, it's a little disturbing because this is, in, in advance of the full implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So, you know, my feeling is like basically farmers are rushing to use as much water as they can, plant the orchard crops, get everything in the ground before they before they can't do it. So I don't know, perhaps we should have anticipated that that's sort of human, like economic driven human behavior. But I find that a little bit disappointing, uh, which is why I would love to get this paper out, out the door. Um, so when we look around at all the aquifers around the world, we find that over half are being depleted, being rapidly depleted. And those are the ones that are in the yellow and the orange and the tan. And you know, the, the Central Valley, actually the Southern part of the high plains is the part that's really gets hit pretty hard. So that's why when you average it over the whole across the Great Plains, it doesn't show up as much. But if you just look at the lower part, it's another big red, red hotspot. So, you know, Northwest Sahara aquifer system, Europe is currently in pretty bad shape. We'll get, we'll get to that. But, you know, Northwestern India, Bangladesh, North China Plain, the Pilbara region here, it's all the, you know, all the usual suspects, Arabian Peninsula um, and, you know, and, and more. Um, 
so you know there is this uh what i call global groundwater crisis um and I've written about it and will continue to write about it and try to sound the, sound the alarm. So what are some of the implications of the of the research uh, for research and for for adaptation? Um, I think Grace has shown us that the human fingerprints this is the first part of the Grace mission has shown us, you know, pretty clearly the human fingerprint on the freshwater landscape through things like climate change, melting ice, changing extremes and water management, like groundwater, you know, poor groundwater management, is a dominant force, is the dominant force that is dramatically changing patterns of water availability. And I don't think it is really appreciated enough that along with that change, there are major threats to not only water security, but food security, because that groundwater is being depleted to grow, uh, to grow food and industry uses I don't know, 80% of the water that's withdrawn, and most of that is agriculture. So again, we're not moving the needle on global water security without industry engagement. And it's happening at a very rapid pace, at a pace that is faster than most people realize, most decision makers realize. And so we got to keep working on that and working on our communication and improving our communication skills. So Grace showed us that you know, that's happening. And the follow on is showing us really that things aren't improving. And I'm just going to show you a series of, of, of uh, figures here from our different papers. And when we publish the paper, that's where the arrow is, right? And the citation on the paper and how things are just continuing on the exactly the same downward trajectory. And this is just some of the papers that we wrote. And it's going to be true for basically everyone that's written some of these large scale papers because those trends are not are not changing. And in some places like California, they're actually getting worse. So in the trend maps and you know the aquifer maps, they look a lot the same, um, if not a little bit worse. And here's our most recent take. And, and so this is a trend map and I'll just point the, and this is watershed based, um, but I'll just point to a couple of differences. First, we don't have the ice sheets on, on here, but they're still melting away at the same clip. But differences, compared to the first map so, you know have been shown or here in Europe there's a lot more red in the past in the past maps you know blue here blue here now it's a lot now there's a lot of red okay and all across the upper part of uh, of uh, Russia is mostly red now even a lot more red in Canada so these high latitude places you know my assumption is they're melting away of course and snow is melting and snow storage is decreasing and permafrost is melting but Lots of work that needs to be done over there, um, and and ironing all that stuff uh, out, and you know understanding what this what this means. Um, you know, just zoom in on Canada a little bit. I often do this for United States and focus on the Southwest, but here, you know, we've got the Gulf of Alaska and down into you know down into BC for sure. That trend uh, is not not looking good. Uh, here's the Mackenzie. Uh, Northwest Territories, of course, you know, that ice is close, you get to the uh, Greenland, all that stuff's just melting away. And then we've got some places that are gaining, you know, Great Lakes and Great Lakes region. I, I left off the Great Lakes. That's the St. Lawrence, Great Lakes, of course, increasing. And uh, and here, uh, where, where I live in, in Saskatchewan, had that big increase for a long time, but now starting to drop off. So I'll have to keep an eye on this. So this is a little bit more dominated by interannual variability here. Um, so you know one other thing about i just want to go back to this I, I should have mentioned this so i showed you this one map where i said you know over half of the world's major aquifers are are being rapidly depleted well sorry then when we look on this watershed basis 56 percent of these so over half are are in the red um so it's time people to actually know about that. And that comes to you know communication stuff, which I'll talk to in just a bit. So some more of the implications. I think food producing regions are in a state of what I call chronic water scarcity. In California, it always used to be like, oh, it's a drought, it's a drought. Drought just makes things worse. Drought, you know, accelerates and exposes the problems. And there's an over-reliance, of course, on groundwater during droughts, which is dangerous because it's such an important buffer for, for resilience. Um, but those 
you know, aquifers are in the red. It's not because of drought. It's because they are using more water than is available on an annual renewable basis. So it's chronic water scarcity or chronic water overuse. Um, I should change that. It's not scarcity. It's, it's overuse. Um, there are distinct classes of water haves and have nots emerging. And that could be just from a quantity perspective. Do you live in a red area? Do you live in a blue area? Do you live above an aquifer that's that's being depleted and your well is running dry and you can't afford to dig that that deeper well in California um, in the middle of the valley where the water table might be you know 2500 feet down it's uh, over a million dollars I think it's like last time I checked to get a to get a like a earthquake proof sort of subsidence resistant you know tolerant uh, well is 1.25 million and that was probably four years ago. Water-driven conflict and climate migration, you know, it happens. I think it's un underreported. Uh, Abram Lusgarten had a great series in uh, the New York Times on climate migration. A lot of it was water-driven. A lot of it was from Central America. I think that we need to do a much better job exploring our groundwater. If they were oil reservoirs, we would have every, you know, nook and cranny and pore space mapped out. Um, and that's you know because we don't value water properly. I think we need to include groundwater as a critical element of national and international water supplies and discussions. We don't do that. We tend to do it state by state, province by province, uh, country by country. Um, and these regional groundwater problems are, of course, regional water problems in general, but regional groundwater problems require regional solutions. And that has not been not been the case. So I've been working writing proposals up here in Canada to tackle some of that, some of the stuff that we just uh, just went through. So just to you know, finish up on a few of the things that, that I've been doing um, to share them with you, in hopes that maybe they can spark some ideas of your own or um, you know, take your feedback, but you know, get you, yeah, I mean, it's just important for us to think out of the box. In general, I think we need to work with a lot more urgency and at the pace and scale of these critical water issues, which is just what I said at the beginning. Um, and I'll just say again, we're not doing it without industry engagement, because that's where all the water is being used. Um, so, you know, one of the financial innovations, so I actually worked with a nonprofit called Ceres to write a report um, that is to be used by investors, and it's called the Global... Uh, assessment of private sector impacts on water. And it's all about arming investors with the information they need, sort of sector by sector, food industry, apparel industry, you know, mining, sorry, mining sector, so that investors can, when they um, have discussions with, um, um, with companies, they can say, listen, we are not investing in you. Coca-Cola, you know, unless you stop depleting groundwater in India, you know, we're not going to invest any money in you. So it's very much the strategy that's been tried in carbon and, and CO2 it works, works quite well. Uh, technology innovations, working actually with a, a, a Silicon Valley tech startup on a, a water reporting platform. Social innovations, thinking about global groundwater sustainability as a social ecological system, doing that with Tom Gleason at UVic and Xander, uh, Xander Huggins, who's a grad student that we co-supervised. And communication innovations. So I'll talk about these water day on the hill and, and what about water. So the global assessment back to the financial step. You know, we did this. We wrote this report. You can go find it online. You might have to register with Series, but um, uh, Series is a Boston-based nonprofit that that works with investors to drive um, to drive corporate sustainability, and they're focused on water. So we wrote this report. It was a very cool experience to work with an NGO for a couple of years. Um, and so we now are taking that report and distilling it down into what are called materiality briefs, which are like two pagers that, in, that we give to investors on each of the sectors. Like, okay, here are the issues in mining, right? Here's the issues in apparel. Here's the, industry, here's the issues in food and beverage. Um, and then that helps them set their expectations um, and helps them set, uh, you know, have meaningful, substantive, conversations with with industry um, so that's been very cool oh yeah here's the front page of the report um, 
So I'm actually working with, I'm the chief scientist of a tech startup, uh, so an actual Silicon Valley startup called Waterquen. And I'm advising them on the science driven, you know, we at Waterplan are building um, a water reporting platform, water accounting platform for industry. So imagine you've got a, you know, report, like the series report, and, and there's going to be a lot of pressure on industry to report water use, just like uh, carbon and, you know, carbon footprints. And so industry then needs a, a platform. They're not just going to like somehow understand how to do it. So we're taking all this science information and, and advising water plan on how to, you know, how to, how to, not how to build the platform. They're great on the software engineering, just like, okay, what are the important water variables? Where did the data come from? What are the good models? And, and uh, how do you calculate risk? So that's been fun, but it also really opens up the door to new research opportunities for like, hey, how should industry be reporting? What are the metrics, right? How efficient is this? financial tool versus say a policy tool what are the standards and benchmarks and things that that you know should be used so it opens up a whole research area as well too which is which is quite cool the social innovation stuff then this is being led by xander huggins and really thinking about global groundwater sustainability in a social ecological systems framework and the proposal i mentioned is to build a transdisciplinary team to explore these pathways to global groundwater sustainability in some of the world's major aquifers. And we're actually get the first part of the proposal, which is called a letter of intent through, but now we have to actually write the proposal over the next couple of months. But you know, the way Xander and Tom are looking at it is it's really a paradigm shift from thinking about groundwater as just like a sort of a resource within the discipline. Like it's groundwater, it's water, you know, that's that's it, versus like, okay, let, really let's think more broadly about groundwater and its ecosystem functions and how it interacts within the earth system. And oh, by the way, it's not just hydrogeology, it's you know, it's economics, it's it's policy. Uh, so so that's been a lot of fun. And Xander took kind of a first crack, and some of you may have seen this paper, I think it was Nature Communications. Um, and uh um it was nature communications and just you know ranking some of the most vulnerable basins so talking about vulnerability not just the pure like you know water storage changes that that i showed you but he's combining those with stress and and uh and you know population and gdp and you know calories produced and that sort of stuff to really understand vulnerability to help sort of guide like okay you know if you're the World Bank, you know, maybe you want to go focus over here versus, I don't know, somewhere up here. Um, so really, really cool work. Um, on the communication side, this is something you might want to pay attention to. Um, we started two years ago, right before COVID, doing a water day on the Hill, Parliament, taking water scientists, including grad students, um, had a uh, day-long event and uh, was co-organized with the uh, science advisor uh, Mona Niemer, who I don't think you can see here um, in this picture. She's sort of recessed right there. Anyway, we've got a bunch of faculty and grad students over here on this side. Um, you know, it's great. I mean, it's great. The goals are really to inform, brief parliament about what we're doing, the importance of water issues, but also practice in science communication. And then some of you may know about this podcast that I do called What About Water, but also it's, you know, it's an outreach platform. So we do like film competitions for middle school and high school kid two minute films. Uh, so really trying to engage, right? Engage with the, uh, I'm, I'm really into like going down into middle school and, and high school to um, let kids know and young adults know about the urgency of the problem, but also like their, you know, careers out there and a lot of them a lot more going on than when i was uh than when i was a kid when i went to college by the way i wanted to be a veterinarian so um if i had known about like earth science i might have i had to discover it myself but i might have been better prepared for it when i got to college uh, some closing thoughts there is really an urgent need for local regional global science engineering policy financial innovations we need to work together we need to really you know, work with the private sector. We need to work with policymakers, planners. You know, it's very much transdisciplinary. Um, we need to be discussing this stuff in the community, 
if we want to make a change on climate. And I see you know, a lot of what the work that I do is the, you know, it's the water, it's the it's the water side of climate, or it's the climate side of water, right? I like to say water is the messenger. It's like a pinned tweet that I have. Um, water is the messenger that delivers the bad news about climate change, basically, you know, to your town, to your, to your front door. Um, but we can't assume that we have all the answers because we're like smart, you know, you know researchers. So we really do need to engage deeply and co-develop. We always need to do and try to do or get our papers peer reviewed and published and do the highest quality work um, because that's our calling card, right? That's our, that's our role in all this. But we do have this responsibility to communicate to stakeholders, to resource managers, elected officials, public, however you can do that. Maybe they're, you know, meetings through your university or some center that you have on campus, or maybe you've got a joint project through a you know, faculty member, your supervisor. Um, or maybe you come to, you know, Water Day on the Hill and you and you talk to elected officials. Um, and we need to integrate across disciplines. So this is the transdisciplinary. So not only interdisciplinary, but reach beyond academics. And that's that's how I use the term transdisciplinary. So I, I, I really think the transdisciplinarity may be the key to greater, greater impact at, at all scales. I do believe I'm done. Yes. Thank you very much.